Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the World Chess Championship 2021, contested by world champ Magnus Carlsen and challenger Jan Nepomnici. We're gonna jump into the recap in a moment, but first, roll the intro clip and let me know if you like it in the comments. Knight c5, king c5, play till king versus king, and we have, and we a, world have a new champ. world champion. He's a, he's a very, very strong opponent, but uh, somebody who also usually gives his opponent chances as well. So in that sense, there's going to be an exciting match. And so we begin our journey to discover who is going to become world champion in 2021. And Jan begins with E4. Now, I actually predicted this. Jan is an E4 player. Of course, at this level of the game, they play everything. But perhaps the biggest surprise came on the first move when Magnus responded with E5. Now, E4, E5 is really, it's, it's what you're gonna get at the highest level, particularly when the stakes are this high. Not when you're playing drunk bullet at 2 a.m. on Lee Chess like Magnus Carlsen likes to do every now and then. I don't know about drunk, but definitely bullet and definitely that website. So this is interesting because against Fabiano Caruana in 2018, uh, oh, I have legal moves on. That's pretty funny. Um, I was playing around with the website earlier. So Magnus only played Sicilian. Like, he only ever played the Sicilian defense uh, in, uh, in 2018 against Fabiano Caruana. That's it. E4, C5 every single game. So it's interesting that he goes for E4, E5. Um, now, knight f3, knight c6. We have bishop b5, the Rui Lopez. Nothing really surprising thus far. Um, you know, black has the option to play the very ultra-solid knight to f6 Berlin defense if Magnus just wants to neutralize the advantage with the white pieces that Jan possesses. Um, but instead he plays a6, Morphe's defense, and the main line with knight f6, castles, bishop e7, and rook to e1. Now, uh, here black employs a strategy that really is centered around the d-pawn. Black is going to move this bishop there, then castle, and then commit this pawn to either of the two squares. Um, if black plays d5, that, those lead to really open lines, where black sacrifices a center pawn known as the marshal. Uh, and if black plays d6, then we get a really maneuvering Spanish. So we have b5, and now, rather than d6 kind of just signaling the intentions immediately, um, Magnus castles and leaves the move, the d-pawn completely untouched. So traditionally white plays c3 here to number one build for the center and number two escape knight to a5 with bishop to c2 and black, since they haven't moved their d-pawn yet, will play d5 and this is known as the Marshall attack, uh, named after Frank Marshall. The point of this is that here, after something like pawn takes, knight takes, take, 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 attacking this, and black playing the move c6, these positions are very scary for white. Even though white is a pawn up, black goes here, here, and more often than not, white doesn't win. Um, black's initiative is far superior to white's material advantage uh, of one pawn. And so after castles, white needs to be a little bit wary, and there's, there's systems here known as anti-marshals. You don't play c3 and completely shut out knight c3, uh, you play h3. This is a, a kind of an anti-marshal because if you, ha if you can put your knight on c3, d5 would lose some of its power. I mean, it's just c3 blocks your own development, right? I mean, you can probably still do this. Um, but here Magnus plays a move that Anish Giri on the live broadcast said he had never seen in his life. Um, unless Twitter misquoted what Anish said. He played knight to a5. Now that move looks on the surface like it simply doesn't make any sense. Uh, if this was a guess the ELO game, I, I might laugh at this move. Um, you're going for the bishop before white was able to bring it back, but you've completely given up the e5 pawn, which just doesn't look like it makes sense. But Magnus plays knight a5, a move that's barely been played at human level, and here's, here's where his preparation is. White has to take the challenge. If white doesn't take the challenge, white simply gives up the bishop pair and black is playing for an advantage. Um, so knight takes e5. We now have knight takes b3. You have to play a takes because it's better to take toward the center, keeping your structure together and activating your rook. And Magnus plays bishop to b7, so now he has an attack on the pawn on e4. Now, white has two choices here, but one is far more natural than the other. Uh, choice number one, the most natural choice, is to just push the pawn one square and defend your pawn. The other option is knight c3 to defend this, 
but then there could be b4 and that attacks your knight but stockfish is trying to tell me that you can just give this pawn up like to the bishop or the knight and just develop around it like put your knight on g3 and you can basically argue like you know what you know what this did uh, I actually am very happy here because my knight is headed to f5 and your structure got a little overextended. I mean, at that level, it literally comes down to did you bait your opponent into making one extra pawn move, surrendering control of certain squares and potentially allowing me to have long-term weaknesses to play against. However, d3 is far more natural and even if you play knight c3, black's next move is coming and black needs to activate the position with the pawn break, d5. If black plays too slowly, white consolidates, white maintains a pawn advantage. So now black creates yet another threat against white center. Jan has to take. If he doesn't take, black takes him. The pawn advantage is gone. So takes, and now queen d5. And in this position, uh, we probably set a record for fastest checkmate in one threat in a world championship match ever. I doubt a four move checkmate was ever played, but queen takes d5. Now. At this point, Jan plays queen to f3, forcing a trade of queens uh, because uh, the queen is on the same diagonal, right, as this bishop. So Jan is like, I'm going to take the safe approach. Uh, if he plays knight back to f3, preventing mate, that's fine. But like that queen is going to hang around, not there, but to one of the other squares. Um, so queen f3 forces a trade of queens. Magnus here plays a really nice move. He doesn't just take for the sake of taking. He says, no, I'm going to make you take me and I'm going to play this move steadily improving my position attacking this knight so far magnus has played every move instantly 13 moves of preparation sounds amazing it's more amazing that he found such a niche line now try to guess white's next move the threat is obviously uh i mean it's like bishop takes knight but it, it's it's a little bit more than that um the threat is like to bring a rook and everything and and pin you and this rook has no guard. There's one and only one good move in this position for white, and it's, it's pretty fascinating. Jan plays it. He actually finds it over the board, and that move is king f1. I mean, that's at the level of the game that we're at. Now, look, if you just play, for example, knight to c3 attacking this queen, you think you're smart. There's queen takes e5. And queen takes e5 is a hidden threat. If rook e5, obviously I take your queen and this is hanging, but if you go there, well, queen e1. And so that is actually why you have to play king to f1. There's a hidden threat here after bishop d6, and it's queen e5. I'm telling you all the natural looking stuff, but queen e5 is a pretty gangster threat. It's pretty gross. Um, and so king f1 defends the rook. It's the best move. And at this point, we are following four games of, I think correspondence chess players so players that play the game like the daily game you know where you you take a long time to so this is like engine backed analysis but during the game erwin lamy uh dutch grandmaster said that computers in the computer chess database have reached this position many times actually not position that's coming as well after king f1 so here magnus also plays a move that uh i mean uh, it simply doesn't look like it makes any sense and this is the level of chess that we're at now Magnus plays the move, rook fb8. Like, if you leave a human alone in this position and they don't know the best move for black, and they're like below 2400, I'm not sure any 2400 or lower player plays rook fb8. Maybe a super GM plays it. That is such a deep move. The point is that you set up the threat of queen e5 again. Queen takes b7 is now defended so you can sack your queen with check and then win that queen back. And when the dust settles, black is actually going to use the rooks that look cramped as a queen side initiative, right? To, to, try to try to push behind those pawns. So bishop d2 played by Jan uh, to try to set up knight c3, also preventing knight b4. Magnus plays c5 and now Jan thinks for a while and comes back with the knight to f3 and Magnus finally takes his first think of the game uh nine minutes into our recap video magnus carlson has actually started thinking once again uh because what anish giri said during the live broadcast is that probably magnus's notes ended here and it said black has compensation 
So black is down a pawn, but black has what's known as the bishop pair. White's queen side really is struggling to move. And the second that white plays the move knight to c3, black zigzags to b4 and attacks the c2 pawn. And the c2 pawn is very soft and delicate. So that doesn't work. Okay, so now Magnus thinks for a while. Knight b4 is still an engine recommendation. Uh, and the point is that at some point, white simply doesn't have any moves. And black at some point is going to move the rooks out from the queen side and pressure down this way and maybe play c4 to try to crack something open. White is going to have to sacrifice the structure on this side of the board and compromise it and just maintain the pawn advantage. So uh, we have rook to d8, which the engine didn't love. Uh, it didn't think that this was the best. It liked, it liked knight b4 straight away. Uh, even rook e8 to try to trade. But rook d8 is an interesting move because it's it's not clear... It's not really clear what the what the point is exactly. It's also very, very, very much baiting bishop a5, which is just an annoying move that, that makes the rook move a second time um, and kind of would fight for certain squares along this diagonal. Um, but knight c3. So knight b4 comes, attacking the c2 pawn, and Jan has a choice of which rook to move. He chooses to move the e rook. Admittedly more passive. Um, he, rook ac1 is also very logical. I don't know exactly what he didn't like. Maybe he just liked the fact that the rook could stay on the A file attacking that side. And, 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 and maybe he thought that by moving the E rook, he has some further flexibility in the future. A rook looks pretty natural, I have to say. But okay, I mean, he obviously had a reason that he decided to do it like this to maintain, you know, kind of constant uh, e -file, uh, A file pressure. Now we have rook C8. And we have the move knight to e2. Okay, so the knight is now rotating out. Uh, and if a few more pieces get traded and Jan can somehow play c3, d4, Jan's a pawn up and he's in the clear. Now here Magnus played a move that puzzled everybody. Uh, it puzzled everybody. So the move is knight c6. He, for whatever reason, decided that he didn't like this position anymore. Um, he didn't want to play just like waiting moves like h6. Uh, or taking right away on f3, so damaging the structure, making the structure obviously very difficult for white to play with in the future, uh, because split pawns, really no pawn mobility. So he decided to get out of there. And uh, now Jan can start making some progress of his own. He plays the best move in this position, which is uh, moving this bishop. He's got to move this bishop. He's got to either fight for the center on this diagonal or this diagonal, or as engines will suggest, going here in order to bait a pawn move out of black to somehow weaken the position and then come back. Very difficult to tell which of the bishop squares is the best square. Um, bishop to c3 also looks very natural, completely negating any forward knight movement. Um, but, uh, and, and some of you might be wondering, isn't b4 strong? No, one pawn move ruins black's entire position because the bishop now goes back and the knight will go to c4. And now that you've pushed the pawn one square, your position is ruined. Your knight can't stand on b4 anymore. So it's the thinnest margin of error, right? So now we see Magnus's plan. He's now rerouting the knight over here because white's position is not mobile. Because of white's passivity, it's really difficult for white to do much. And I always like to say, pawn play in a position determines so much. If you can't move your pawns, you are really going to struggle. Like right now, take an inventory of the, of the space advantage of the players, right? So count the amount of squares you control on the enemy side of the board. I mean, black is really doing a good job. And I mean, this knight is coming forward. These pawns fight. None of white's pawns fight for any space on the opposing side. So Magnus has a lot more space, okay? Um, bishop f4. It's time for Jan to start trading some pieces. Uh, he also can play knight g3. This would definitely keep the game going a little bit more. Magnus would probably go knight d5, setting up a threat of this, this, and bishop takes g3. Maybe something like rook 2e1 is played, but then, you know, the knight is kind of always potentially lurking to come back to b4. Um, you can also just get two bishops versus two knights if you really want. Uh... So, you know, the, the, the possibilities are, are really, really endless here for both players. Jan finally makes a concrete decision to play bishop to f4 and start trading some pieces. Uh, now that he's done this, Magnus has to play his next move. Magnus cannot just take this bishop and not take this. So, for example, if Magnus plays like just even h6, uh, Jan now has no queenside pressure. Nothing is pressuring his queen side. He now goes to create an initiative. At the end of the day, he has seven pawns. Magnus has six. Uh, so Magnus does this. 
he trades like this, and now the pawn advantage is really not felt as much. But black still has to be accurate. Why is it not felt so much? Well, Magnus plays the best move. What is the best move in this position? What does black do? Now, you're not going to fight fire with fire, that, that, or just fight fire in the first place. This doesn't make any sense, because you see Ma uh, Jan's plan. It's now paying off. The rook constantly pressures this pawn. Um, if you trade all the pawns incorrectly, uh, you're just leaving Jan with, with some artillery here. That, that's not really what you want. No. You want to continue to restrict the queenside movement, and now you need to activate your worst rook, which is this one, because that rook stares into a pawn. This rook has an open file. So you are now threatening to rotate your rook over while constantly defending a6. Very, very flexible move by Magnus. And the problem is when you have four pieces on the same file, it's going to be really difficult to come up with some play here. Jan plays rook to e1, activating his rook. Knight jumps to f5, not complicated. And now the knight is threatening to jump it on two sides. One side you can prevent, the other side you cannot really prevent. I mean, unless you go knight g2, which is just utterly depressing. So c3. The drawback of c3 d3 and b3 are now very weak, very colorful. Um, and if you're, you struggle with colors, these two pawns side by side, d3 and b3, are weak. But you do prevent knight d4, but you don't prevent knight h4. How do you defend the pawn on f3? Do you have to defend the pawn on f3? Um, well, rook e3 played. He decides to defend it. Now Magnus plays king f8. King f8 also surprised commentators. Uh, because they thought it was far more natural to begin with g6. g6 prevents, obviously, any knight movement, um, and uh, it's, a little bit more, it, it's a little bit more flexible. So maybe king g7 is going to be the way to go, not king f8. Maybe king g7, king f6. Maybe even king f5 in the future. So you're going to walk in straight down the middle, not really worrying about the rook infiltration. And, um, well, yeah, I mean, that's what king f8 does. It prevents rook e7, also rook e8 ideas in the future. Um... So, Magnus decided to play king f8. Uh, actually, machine after g6 already thinks black is actually better, despite being a pawn down. So g6 would have been just a moment that perhaps he would have, you know, walked his king up and tried to pressure Jan. He plays king f8, though. Uh, and now Jan says, oh, now's my moment. Fantastic. So in, in positions like this, you are constantly thinking of the simplifications, like the ramifications of trading the rooks of trading one rook, of trading a rook and a knight, right? What kind of an endgame are you looking for? If you trade your good knight for this bad knight, well, now you're in the clear if you're white. You have, you'll never, ever, ever lose this. And only you will ever play this for a win because again, two rooks and seven is better than two rooks and six. That's just how it works. That's chess math. All right, so knight to f5 attacks the rook and now the rook goes up. The difference here is that the king is not actually closer to the middle. So you're not actually activating your king, which is important in the endgame. At this point, Jan plays knight back to e1. We have knight back to g7. And now we see the idea. The idea is to create this. So Magnus wins yet even more space with his pawns while everything defends everything else. And at this point, everyone's thinking, all right, Magnus Carlsen is now officially playing this for a win. This is vintage Magnus, somehow down a pawn in obscure line of a Ruy Lopez. And he's trying to play this for a win with the move b4. I told you a long time ago that the c3 move prevented knight d4 but weakened its neighbor pawns. The move b4 is a direct attack on c3 but an indirect attack on b3 because you're going to use the pawn break to bring the second rook to pressure this pawn. Now it's, it's, it, you gotta put your game face on if you're Jan Yuponichi. As Fabiano Caruana said during the broadcast, right now you go, what the hell happened? I was better, I was maybe equal throughout this game. Why am I now suddenly under pressure? This doesn't make any sense. Okay, time to be concrete. What is Jan gonna come up with? What is he gonna think about here? What's the game plan? He plays king to e2. The idea of this move is really interesting. Magnus plays rook to b8, and Jan walks his king over. b takes c3, the point is not to take with the king and protect this pawn. That's not what Jan wants, because then knight d4 does come, and this, and this is a nightmare, you lose game one of the world championship. No. No. Jan forces Magnus' hand. If Magnus wastes any more time, King c2, and the king gives a big old group hug to all the pawns, and everybody's protected. So, he forces Magnus' hand, and he says, Magnus, 
you can have the B3 pawn, which is shocking because oftentimes in these really un like uncomfortable positions, if you don't part ways with your material and transform the position in a way that you can hold, you will lose. If you try to be too greedy and hold on to everything, you will lose. So rook takes b3 and now king c2. Now it looks like black can play this and this is a problem, but it's not. That rook is something known as overloaded. And here comes kaboom. You can check me because if you take the rook, I take. But if you check me, I just slide back and white wins. Very nice little tactical sequence, right? Which is why rooks have to fight on open lines. You guys are seeing this. These rooks are fighting on the open lines. That's why the rooks have to go to open lines and end games, right? So king c2, Magnus plays rook b7, setting up a really nasty trap. Knight to d4 check. Not really a trap, but it's only a trap if you take it, for example. If you take it and get hit with a discovered attack and lose your rook, you lose. Knight d4 looks really unpleasant. And there is the threat. Oh, sorry. And there is the threat of knight to g5. Attacking this, potentially going past that pawn, attacking f2. It's a pretty unpleasant position, and there is basically one move here. There's maybe two moves that can force, but there is one really high-level move. And uh, I think Hikaru, during his live broadcast, said there's no way Jan plays it. And if Jan plays it, Hikaru will gift 100 subs to his own chat. And Jan played it. And that move is only worrying about knight g5 and not worrying about knight d4. And that move is the very cool common collected, the unsupervised grandmaster, h4. Of course, this one is not very alpha zero like, it's just h4. The point is that knight d4 check, there is simply king d1. And you say, and? And? So? What's the threat? Well, now I am threatening to take the knight. So once h4 comes, now if black plays rook b6 trying to come here, white just can play rook a2, or even king c1, because this is not a check and this is under pressure. So Magnus plays king f7, preemptively protecting the knight on e6 to try to set up certain bad intentions over here. We have rook back to e1, and now if rook b6 gets played, Rook a2 prevents any infiltration, and actually maybe even white in the future will go and attack that pawn, which shows you a long time ago why Jan wanted to fight on the a-file. Um, so instead of that, we get king to f6. Now the players get their extra hour. They've made it to the 40th move of the game. They get their extra hour. And knight c4, threatening knight to e5. We have rook to e7, and we have a repetition of moves. Game one of the World Championship 2021 match has been drawn. Impressions of the game. First of all, are you satisfied with the repetition? No, I want them to fight to king versus king. I want them to fight till they're underpants both game. I want them to, it's getting sweatier and sweatier in the room. Strip down, keep boxing. No, 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 look. Jan has not liked his position for a long time. He is fine with the repetition. This is not a position that White has any business playing for a win. Okay, black probably also. It is a point where if you try to push forward, you overcommit your position, you're going to lose. So, impressions of the game. Will Jan play e4 again? Vishwanathan Anand from India, five-time world champion, says no. He thinks that Jan will play e4 for the first game and never again, even though Jan is an e4 player. If it seems like Magnus will not be imbalancing every single game like he did in 2018, e4, e5 might not be the way to go. We might see d4, c4, knight f3. Uh, Magnus comes prepared in an anti-martial, sacrifices a pawn. Now we're going to be seeing this variation all over Blitz and, uh, and bullet games on the internet. Um, and uh, a fascinating first game where Magnus sacked a pawn for a bishop pair compensation, completely shut down White's play. Jan had to be super accurate, king f1. And then later on finding um, uh, this king walk. I mean, Magnus pressured and pressured and pressured. And I mean, to find after the move b4, you know, this idea that you can play king e2, king d2, sack the pawn, and get your king over in time. Good defense by Jan, finding a way out, but game one is in the books. Not the most fascinating fan favorite of games, but it shows you the extent of the opening preparation, and it could be a preview of things to come, but it's only game one. I'm not ready to overreact yet. Folks, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoy the coverage, and if you're still watching this on Black Friday, all my courses are 40% off. We have a Black Friday sale that ends 
in like seven hours. So if you haven't gotten a course yet, link is in the description. Peace out, y'all. I'll see you for the second game. Get out of here.